This interview is being conducted on November 10th, 2005 at the Niles Public Library in Niles, Illinois. My name is Kate Wallachie. I am speaking with Mr. Norman Carroll. Mr. Carroll was born on August 6th, 1922 and now lives in Glenview, Illinois. Where were you born? In Chicago. In Chicago, he was born. Uh, Mr. Carroll learned of the Veterans History Project through the library I'm poster? Through the Niles Library poster, aren't we great? He has kindly consented to be interviewed for the project. Here is his story. So, we usually start at the beginning, unless you have something you like to talk about first. You don't care? Okay. What, when did you enter the service? I entered the service, I believe it was April the 5th, 1943. Yeah. And what were you doing? Where were you living when you... I was living at 6231. <laughs> Stewart Avenue in Chicago, Illinois at the time. Were you at, living with your parents? or? Your I was still with my parents. Mm -hmm. And what did you, what were you doing before you were drafted? I was studying to be a linotype operator at that time. And I was working, working for Mercury typesetting at the mm -hmm. time. Wow. I had finished high school and I went to linotype school to learn linotype and I was working at Mercury typesetting as an apprentice at the time. So you must have been fairly young, about 20 or 21? No, about a little over, about 18 and a half, 19. Oh my goodness, 18. <laughs> so young. So you're very young. So uh, did you choose the Army when you were drafted or were you just drafted? No, I was drafted army? and I chose to go into the Army. Why? Why? I figured that my father was in the army, and I figured in World War One. So I figured I'll go into the army also. To be like him. To be like him. Be like him. Where were you inducted? You I was that? inducted at Camp Grant, Illinois. Okay. And what was it like your first days? It was amazing. <laughs> so many other young men. You know, were all. I'm wondering what this all about. <laughs> Where are we going? It was, it was, it was very, you know, unusual. Did you did you meet people you think you wouldn't have otherwise met? I met people that ordinarily I would not have met from all over. From all over all, the country, the, all over all the over state. the country. Wow. And it, it was an experience. Yeah, so do you remember anything in particular about starting out? Well, I remember we spent a few days at Camp Grant and they were interviewing us. And then we went on a train and we went to Camp Wheeler, Georgia, where we took our basic training. And I was at Camp Wheeler, Georgia for 13 weeks as an infantry replacement trainee. And we what were, does that mean? In other words, we were replacements for the casualties. We had 13 weeks of basic training. I got a 10-day furlough, went back home, and uh, then we were shipped overseas. So I had a little over three months in the States, and then I and went overseas. So do you remember, was it, had you ever been away from home for a long no, time before? No, no, no. So was that strange it for was, you? It was an adventure. It was an adventure. Yeah. Were there, uh, they put in, I have in my list, were there, did you have drill instructors? Oh did yes, have, we had drill instructors and we learned how to shoot a rifle and read maps and, you know, hike long hikes and field training and it, it was an adventure. So did you have any have any use for your your experience as a linotype operator? Did you No, no, no. <laughs> they didn't they didn't, no, no. they didn't have anything for linotype no, operators. No, no. In this service? They needed us for you know replacement for casualty replacement. Where did you sleep? Do you remember? In the barracks while we were in yeah, while, while you were in training. Yeah, we had barracks at Camp Wheeler, Georgia. Did you? Was it a lot of other oh, people yeah. really close? Oh, or? oh, yeah, we were close. Okay. okay, where did you go? So after that, you went overseas? 
after that I got the 10 day furlough right. and I came back and they shipped us right overseas. So where did you leave from? We left from uh, San Francisco and our first stop was New Caledonia. Oh, wow. That was uh, where they tried to find out where you're going to go from there. You know, where, what army, you know, what division you would be sent to. And I was sent to the 37th Division. It was an Ohio National Guard Division. And we, we were sent to Guadalcanal. This was after the fighting was over on Guadalcanal. And we were to replace the casualties there. Now the third, now the 37th Division that I was sent to was pretty well beat up from the Battle of Guadalcanal. And they sent us up in the hills to give us further training. And uh, we were, we were in Guadalcanal for, I would say, six, seven weeks. And from there we invaded Bougainville in the Solomon Islands. And that was my first experience in combat on Bougainville. Like? What was that like? It was scary. <laughs> it was scary. And we, we invaded Bougainville and uh, it, like I say, it, it, it was dramatic, it was dramatic. You see all the casualty, the bombings, and we were under fire and we were on Bougainville for 13 months fighting the Japanese. And that's where I got my bronze star medal fighting on Hill 700. Our platoon was going up on Hill 700, trying to recapture the hill. We were crawling up the hill under enemy fire. We lost about four or five of them. my buddies going up that hill. I'll never forget it, never forget it. Our whole platoon received a Bronze Star Medal for that, for that battle. And as I say, I, I lost some good friends of mine. And believe me, I was scared to death going up that hill. I'm sure. I'm sure. You said four or five of your, your friends, were they people you had uh, right. trained with? Trained with. That, you know, for basic training. Wow. And something you'll never forget. You'll ne I'll never forget that. Yeah. You know you can enter them into the Library of Congress's um, Veterans Memorial. They have a website that you oh, can Oh, really? Put, yeah, you can put in people's names. Mm. They put you in when you are interviewed. Isn't that something? Yeah. A, it's a huge database. Oh, my God. That's really something. Yeah. It, um, did you feel? Did you feel lucky that you had not died, or did you feel? I was lucky. I felt lucky. I felt lucky that that I was able to get out of there alive. Mm -hmm. But it hurt to see your your buddies, you know. And as I say, as Tom Brokaw wrote in his book. Art was a greatest generation. It really was. And as I say, I'm short of stature. I'm only five feet three. But believe me, I felt tall when I stood my tongue. I stood tall. So did you, um, so you were in um, your you did it more, some more training in Guadalcanal. Right. And then you were in... Then we invaded Bougainville. Then you invaded Bougainville. Bougainville. And then, um, how, you said that was 13 months? We were on Bougainville for? 13 months. Oh my goodness. Fighting the Japanese. Did you have, did you have times when you were on the front lines and times when you were oh, not? Oh yeah, we had, we had many times in rest areas. Our main fighting on Bougainville was capturing Hill 700. 
that was our biggest engagement. How long did it take? It took a couple of days till we recaptured wow. that hill. Other other outfits, you know, went up too, and they recaptured it. And then they lost it again in the Japanese counterattack. But in our in our last battle, we did ca capture Hill Seven Hundred. Something I'll, I'll never forget. I'll never forget. Do you remember what it? Um, do you dream about it, or you think about it a lot? At times, I do. Do you remember what it smelled like, or what it oh, sounded God. like? Can you describe it? The artillery shells, and the stench of dead bodies. It's something you, you never can forget. And when I think of what's going on in Iraq, it hurts the hell out of me to see our soldiers getting killed like that. But what you've been through it, you realize what it is. Pardon me, I can't help it. I, <laughs> That's okay. I'm a I, get, I, get, I get a little emotional. But it, it's an experience I'll never forget. And I'll remember as long as I live. Which is a pretty good long time so far. <laughs> right. <laughs> and now the people at the Library of Congress will know too. I'm sure they know a lot. I'm sure they have. There's a lot of stories. Anyway, after after 13 months on Bougainville, our next objective was the Philippine Islands. And uh, we invaded Luzon in the Philippines. That's the, the main island. We landed on Langayan Gulf. We had no opposition when we reached the beach. We were expecting, you know, a lot of opposition, but there was no opposition when we hit the beach. And we didn't hit into any opposition until we got near Manila. There's when our outfit caught hell around Manila. We lost our first lieutenant of our platoon in the Battle of Manila. And uh, I was lucky too. I, I escaped, you know, unharmed. But we had, you know, we had other casualties in our, in our, you know, company. And after the Battle of Manila was over, we were sent to a rest area in the suburb of Manila. And we were there for, I'd say, four or five weeks, just resting. And from there, they sent us to Baguio. That's the summer capital of the Philippines. It's in the mountains. And uh, we fought the Japanese in Baguio. Then we went back to our rest area. And that's where I came down with malaria. <laughs> <laughs> now, didn't they give you, didn't they give you oh, quinine? Yeah. So you wouldn't... We were taking, it was called Adabrin at the time, and we were taking it every day, but you still came down with, I guess it did help prevent it, you know, from uh, being, you know, you know, more serious. But that's when I came down with malaria. And it actually it happened. On August the 6th, the day they dropped the A-bomb, and I came down with malaria. My goodness. <laughs> when they dropped the A-bomb on Hiroshima. So were you sick for I, a I long was, time? I was, I was in the hospital for oh several weeks. Uh, and then we came back to our outfit. And then we were, you know, going to be sent back home after, I must have been about 28, 29 months overseas, yeah. and then we were sent home to be a discharge. Were you excited? Oh, I was thrilled to death. I was thrilled to death. I was thrilled to death. And, uh, you know, during the time I was in service, everything was censored. And uh, you, you couldn't say where you were or where you were going. I wanted my folks and my 
future wife to know where I, where I was. So what I did, I remembered in Chicago, there was a superintendent, Dr. Johnson, but before him, the superintendent of school was named Dr. Bogan. I sent the letter to my sweet. I said, Ann, find out who was the superintendent of school before Dr. Johnson. His name was Dr. Bogan. <laughs> so she knew right away I was on Boganville. <laughs> <laughs> and then when we were going to the Philippines, it was also sent so you couldn't say where you were going. So I had a cousin of mine. His name was Philip. So I wrote to the, find out, uh, I'm going to see uh, Molly's husband. His name was, Phil. I'm going to see Molly's husband in, in a short time. His name was <laughs> Phil. So they knew we were going to the film. You know, we had our way of you know, getting around the fencer. <laughs> it was wrong, but we wanted to know where. Did you write a lot of letters back and forth? Everything was V mail. Oh, yeah. Everything was V mail. And, uh, that's how we would, you know, write our letters. And did you? Did it take a long time for letters to get to and it from did. home? It did. It, it took uh, several weeks to get letters back and forth. And uh, then I, we would get packages from home every now and then. So what did you like to get best? Uh, like salamis, things like that. <laughs> you know, that you know, that wouldn't you know, were perishable. And <laughs> and we would share it with all our buddies, and when they got packages, we would share everything. You know, we were close. We were close. You know, we, we were together for like 28, 29 months, and we were close, and we would share everything. So what were you eating, and where were you living when you were on the islands? We ate a lot of C rations, K rations. And once in, once in a while, we were getting hot meals. But the thing that I missed most was ice cream. I'm an ice cream lover. <laughs> and we couldn't get ice cream. Once in a great while, we would get that. But when I was in the hospital, when I had malaria, they were coming with ice cream. I was so thrilled <laughs> with ice cream. <laughs> it was worth getting malaria. It was worth getting the ice cream. <laughs> But like I say, it was an experience that you'll never forget. You'll never forget. Well, when you were, now, you took a ship between between islands? Oh, yes. And when you were on the islands, how did you travel around? Did you march or did you? We marched. We were on jeeps, you know, going to, you know, other places on the island. And was it, uh, had you ever been any place that wasn't the United States before? No. So did you, was it interesting to see the different, oh, different plants and Absolute, different people? Absolutely, was was completely different. And uh, when we went to the Philippines, you know, after the fighting was over in Manila, I met, you know, quite a few people that I became friendly with. And so what was that like? Do you remember any of them? Oh, yeah. Tell me about them. Well, <laughs> When I went overseas, I I wasn't married <laughs> at the time, <laughs> and I met a young lady there, <laughs> and uh, she was a mestiza. In other words, she was part Spanish, and part Filipino, and she was a student at the University of the Philippines before the Japanese invaded the island, and we became very friendly. And. When I came back home, we corresponded for quite a while. Wow. Remember her name? Salud. We called her Sally. In Philippines, it was Salud, but we called her Sally. Oh, interesting. And like I say, we corresponded for quite a while. And then, well, I, then I got married when I, about six months after I was discharged, I got married. And I was married for 36 years. And then my wife developed cancer and I lost her. 
But I found a wonderful person a year later. And I've been married now to my second wife for 21 years. Oh my goodness. That's a, they're two very long relationships. <laughs> two long, <laughs> <two> long relationships. <laughs> so, um, how did you, let's see, how did you pass the time when you, when you weren't fighting? What did you do? We played cards, mostly played cards on the island. Did you get good at it? I got lucky sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I lost everything. <laughs> but what was there to do? There was anything else to do. And we played, you know, baseball, things like volleyball, you know, when we were in rest areas, when we were, you know, in combat. Because there was a lot of times in, on the islands when you were just, you weren't in combat, you were just sitting in your rest area, you know, doing things, playing cars, doing, playing baseball, volleyball, you know, anything just to keep active. Did you ever run into anybody that you had known at home? No, I never did. I never ran into anyone that I knew. It. Because when I was inducted, I was sent to uh, to Camp Wheeler, and there were people from all over the country, you know, from the south, from the west, and then we were sent overseas, and then we became together, all these people. But I never knew anyone from home that uh, I served with. But so did you meet people? Now Chicago is a pretty diverse yes. community. Did you meet people um, from other ethnicities, oh, from yes. other races, oh, yes. and, and yes. was that different for you? Very different. I met this a uh, lot of people from, from in our that were from the south, and. They were different. They were different. They believed in werewolves, things like that. They believed in werewolves? Right, things like that. That sounds like a story. There no sto <laughs> Who believed in werewolves? This one kid, this A.C. Jenkins, he believed in werewolves and things like that. It must have I, made him nervous in the, in the jungle. I think so. And I think he only went to about fifth or sixth grade at that time. He wasn't that, he was very educated, never finished, you know, school. Well, I, actually, I had not a high school education at the time. But you met so many different people, diverse people, and we became friends, we became close. You got to appreciate everybody. And uh, I, there's one story I have to tell you. We were, it, it was, we were on Bougainville, and we were in a small perimeter. The Japanese were maybe like 50 yards away from us. At night, we were in our foxhole. You could not get out of your foxhole. You had to stay in your foxhole. As soon as you were out, you were shot. You were considered an enemy. We had this one southern fellow in our outfit. He hated the Japs. He hated them like crazy. And the Japs, you could hear them, they were yelling at us. You die Yankee. You die Yankee. You're dead. The fellow couldn't stand it. So he comes out and yells, Tojo eats shit. <laughs> they believe this. They told you eat shit. <laughs> Two minutes later, the Jap, he had Ellie dog eat I'll never forget as long as I live. <laughs> and believe me, it's the gospel too. <laughs> That's so terribly funny. See, there were funny experiences, things that I, you never, you, I'll never forget these things as long as I live. <laughs> so, did you? Now you were uh, you were in the Pacific Theater. Did you get news about the European oh, Theater? Oh yeah. Did you? Oh yeah. We we always got news. You know we had radios. We we're able to keep up with the news. And did you get to hear news from home? Yeah. Did you worry about home while you were gone? I did. I 
worry. I'm a worrier by nature. I'm a worrier. But at, at least I, you know, I wasn't married at the time. I didn't have any children. But I worried about my parents and, you know, my uh, sweetheart back home. I worried how they were doing. But they always wrote me. I, I got so many letters. They always wrote me. My parents and my sweetheart, they always wrote me. So did you keep the letters or did you did no, you lose them no, along I, the I way? Didn't, I couldn't keep There was no place to keep them. Yeah. But uh, as I say, it, it's an experience that you'll never forget. You'll never forget. So do you keep in touch with any of the people that you met? I, I kept in touch with quite a few of my buddies for several years after we got discharged. But gradually, you lose track. You lose track. But I'll say this, I'll always remember my fellow soldiers and buddies that I served with. I'll never forget them. And those never came back. <laughs> you can't, <laughs> you, you, it's in your heart. You just can't uh, get away from it. But like I say, it's an experience that I'll never forget. Were you glad that you had been drafted, that you got to? Yes, yes. If I would have been rejected, I, I don't think I could have lived through it. I, want, I wanted to serve my country. You know, I was a young kid at the time, and I wanted to serve my country. And, and I did. I did. So when they, when they dropped the bombs, and the the war ended. How did you um, how did you feel about that? Did you feel did you I had I have interviewed one person who was um, actually in Japan some a, a short time after they dropped the bomb, and, and his opinions on it are different from other people's. I always like to hear what people think. The bomb saved our lives. Before they dropped the bomb, we were being told. Our next objective would be the Japanese home islands, and they could expect a million American casualties. You are not only going to fight the Japanese army, you're going to fight men, women, and children. They were fanatics. They were fanatics. In all the time I was overseas in Kabe, we never captured a Japanese soldier. Never. They would commit Harry Carey. They would not be captured. That would, they were, they were ingrained. They were born like that. It, it, it was, it was a sin to be, to be captured. They, they, they would die, but they would not be captured. And they're so different from you know, from our beliefs. But it's something I'll, I'll never forget. So did you, um, I always ask this, did you have a, have a chaplain in your yes, unit? Yes, yes. And did you, did you ever talk to the chaplain or did you? Oh yes, he would always come around. He would always come around. In fact, even in combat, he was with us. He was with us. Wow. He was with us. Did you, now I don't know what religion you I'm are. I'm Jewish. So I'm did you Jewish. find, were there, were there other Jewish people in your unit, or were you? We had a few Jewish uh, in our company. And was it different to be with, you know, in Chicago, um, we tend to be sort of separated by religion a bit. Did, was it? No, 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 no. So were, were you, did you practice religion when you were at home, I did. or did you? I was never really, re, you know, religious. I, I would go to the high holidays, like Yom Kippur. That that was it. My family was never, you know, really. Uh, so did that change after the war? Was it pretty much the same? The same, the same. I still go to high holidays, but I, I'm not a religious fanatic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I believe in my religion, but that's as far as it goes. Yeah. It's a, it's my mother is a chaplain, so I always ask. I always uh -huh. want to know. I'm nosy. <laughs> and did you, um, oh, they put in here when you were off duty, or were you ever on, on leave when you were 
um, when you were in the Pacific? We, no. They always talked that they were going to send us to New Zealand for a rest there. We never got no. it. We never got it. We were hoping that we would be sent you know, to uh, New Zealand or Australia, but our outfit never got there. Too busy. Too busy. We were too busy. So did you celebrate holidays when you were in the service? Did you celebrate Thanksgiving? And... As best we could. Yeah. You know, about Christmas or Thanksgiving. But you know, m mostly on the islands. You don't have the facilities for that. But we did celebrate as much as we could. So what did you do as much as you could? Do you remember? Not really. Hmm. It was just another day. It was another day. So what did you wear when you were when you were overseas? Did you have more than one uniform? Did you Most of the time when we weren't in combat, we were in shorts. Because in the Pacific it was you know, very, you know, hot out there. And so most of the time we're just, you know, in shorts. But in combat we were, had our, you know, re regular fatigues. But the rest of the time we were just in shorts, like, like in the, like in the summer here. <laughs> like in the movie. Right. <laughs> um, did you, Oh, there was something I was going to ask, and it's gone from my head. That's unfortunate. Did your did your rank change over the course of the war? No, I was a PFC all the time. The whole time. And you won two bronze stars. Is that what it said? One, One bronze star. One bronze star. Yeah. That was for Hill Seven Hundred. And what you had, you listed some other yes. service awards. What else did you get awards for? <coughs> Let's see, I believe there's a Philippine medal. And, uh, and do you want to tell me um, on the tape about how your medals were destroyed and they replaced you? Yes. When I got home, we had just moved to a new place, and I gave my medals and decorated to one of my daughter to hold. They had the fire at my daughter's house, and they were all destroyed at, in the fire. And that's how I, we lost my medals and decorate, and my daughter lost practically everything in the, in the fire. She was living in Round Lake Beach at the time, mm -hmm. and all the, the medals were destroyed. So that's, when was it last year I wrote to you know, our congressman Mark Kirk, that I, I would like to have the medals back. But at that time, I wasn't feeling well. I didn't know how much longer I would be, and I wanted my granddaughter to have the medals when I was gone. And sure enough, he came through. <laughs> and then, uh, after I got the medals, I, I called uh, his staff assistant that you know was handling it. I said I want to thank you know. Mark Kirk in person, you know, for getting the medal. And he said, wait a minute, Norm. He said, we're having this veterans on the Memorial Day, and I want you there to be on the podium to receive your medal, your bronze star. <laughs> That's how I got uh, to, you know, meet Mark Clark. How neat. Did you, um, so when you came home, um, what did you do in the time just after you were discharged and that when you got home? Well, I rested for about a month. Just took it easy. And then I went back to uh, where I was working before. As a, as a, see, I was an apprentice before I went into service. And naturally I got my job back. And. Uh, had I someone else been doing your job in between, or had it just been empty, do you know? Well, I suppose they did hire somebody at the time that I was gone. But uh, when I came back, I was, you know, back in my job. Actually, it was, a, it was like a six-year apprenticeship that we had to serve in our, 
I belonged to Chicago Typographical Union, mm -hmm. and there was a six-year apprenticeship. Now, before I went into service, the place where I worked was a non-union shop. To get into the Chicago Typographical, it was like father to son, like the movie projectors union. There was no way to get into it. But after I got out of service, I found out that the place that I was working, Mercury Type City, the owner got into the union because there was a strike and in order to hold some of his account, he had to go into the union. Mm -hmm. So I automatically was able to get into the typographical union well, that way. Nice. And as I said, there was a six year apprenticeship, but I had already served a couple of years. So they put me in as a fourth year apprentice. So I served two more years apprentice and then I got my journeyman's card. So did, were, did you do that your whole working career or did you change yes. jobs at all? Yes, I, after I got my journeyman's card, I went into Progress Printing Company, and I was there for about 35 years. And I was superintendent of the shop for the last 10 years. Wow. And uh, this Progress Printing was on 33rd in Halsted. The owner was a personal friend of Mayor Dick Daly, the original mayor, and all of the Democratic work had to come through our shop. It's <laughs> <laughs> a pretty good deal. Did you go back to school at all, ever? No, no, no. So you didn't use the GI Bill for school? Or? No, because be, actually when I came back out of service, I went back to my profession as a line, right. but I was an apprentice, but through the GI Bill, I was able to get the you know, extra money for, you know, for being an ex-service man. Mm -hmm. And that's how uh, it worked out. So did you, I was just reading, have been reading a, a book that talked about um, the growth in, in housing. Were you able to buy a house with assistance from the GI Bill no, or did no, you live in? No, no, no. The assistance I got was uh, from the, you know, they upped my salary while I was an apprentice. That's nice. No, but uh, we bought a home after I got married. Yeah. When did you get married? In 1946. So very soon after. Yeah, about a year married. after I got home, we got married. And I say we were married for 36 years. And then I lost my wife to cancer. And I remarried about two years later to my present wife. And now we've been married for 21 years. <laughs> and they didn't get sick of you yet. Pardon? And they didn't get sick of you yet, huh? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> did you join a veterans organization at I, all? I did. Uh, I joined the Jewish Veterans. And I was there for a few years. And then gradually you dropped out. You know, a lot of, you know, veterans left. Some moved away. And, mm -hmm. But I did for a few years. Have you ever attended um, any reunions? No, I never did. Do you think they have them for your unit? They did. See, our 37th Division was an Ohio National Guard, and uh, I never did go back there. So were a lot of the people from Ohio, or because there were so many replacements? The original division was from Ohio, but we were infantry replacements. Right. So when we went overseas, you know, we were from all scattered from all over the country, but I I did keep in touch with you know a lot of my buddies you know for a number of years, and then gradually you you know you lose track of. Them. Did you um, talk about your experiences with other veterans or with your family when you got home? Somewhat, somewhat. Sometimes it's hard to talk about that. But you know, they did want to know something, and talked a little, but I didn't want to talk to them. It hurts, it hurts when you talk about it. Your buddy that didn't come back, that you were close to, it hurts. But like I say, it's an experience I'll never forget. Well, did you have uh, any brothers and sisters? 
Yes, I have. And, I have one brother, he, and uh, he he got into the navy. I wrote him. He was a younger brother. I wrote him a letter before he went into service. I said, Leo, don't go into the army because you're going to be put into the infantry. I said, try to get into the navy, and he wanted to why. We slept in foxholes. I said, at least in the Navy, you're aboard ship. You have a place to sleep, to eat, hot meals. We didn't get that. We were living on C and K rations and living in foxholes. So he listened to me and he got into the Navy. So did he, did he, was he was younger than you? Yeah, he's four years younger than So I. did he serve? He served uh, in the Navy and uh, he was on Okinawa when the Japanese, in the kamikazes, but Nakawa, he, he came out okay. He was on a minesweeper, but he came out okay. That's pretty lucky. <laughs> right. We were both lucky. So do you think your, your um, service and your experiences affected your life? How do you think it affected your life? How did it Maybe it made me milder than I was. I used to have a little temper. <laughs> Why did it make you milder? Because I had seen so much. Maybe that's not the word milder. It's I'm trying to think of a better word. Maybe less wilder than. <laughs> More, mat more mature, maybe more mature. More mature sure. Maybe that's the better word. And did it affect your health at all? I mean, besides yes. the malaria. Yes. <laughs> when I got out, when I got discharged, an aunt of mine was dying, and all of her nephews and I, we went to you know, donate blood. They wouldn't take my blood. I said, why not? Because I have malaria. They could not take my blood. Mm -hmm. They could not take my blood. I said, once you have malaria, it's in your system. And they wouldn't take my blood, you know, when I we wanted to donate it to my aunt. But otherwise, I, I've been healthy. But the last 10 years, I, I have prostate cancer. In fact, I'm going this afternoon for another bone scan because my PSA level has jumped up again. And the urologist said he wants me have another bone scan. But otherwise, I've been pretty healthy. <laughs> and did, um, did your military experience influence the way you thought about war or about the military? Did that? Yes. What changed or what do you? This Iraq war, I can't see it. I can't see it. I can't see all these young men dying out there, dying out there. Every day, another two, three American soldiers are getting killed. I don't think we had any business going in there. And it hurts me to see these young men dying out there. It hurt, it really hurts me to see that. Did you feel that way during Vietnam too? Yes, yes, we didn't belong there. I felt the same way in Vietnam as I do for this Iraq war. So do you ever uh, protest or do you? No, I never, I never protested. You know, like some of these demonstrate, I never did. But sometimes I felt I should have, but I never did. But it's a strong, it's a strong voice when you, when you have been in the military. Right. When you've seen, when you've been through this and you've seen all this carnage, It hurts. It hurts when, it, and when I see these young men every day, two or three. It's already past the two thousand mark. Mm -hmm. So what can I say? What can I do? There's not much that I can do. Mm -hmm. But I would like to see them get out of there. But how? It, it's so hard. You know, we're in there now. Yeah. What? What the answer is. What is the answer? God knows. God knows what the answer is. Mm -hmm.
We hope so. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> Did you feel differently about the Second World War? That it was, you know, like a, like Studs Terkel's book, it was the good war. You you feel like there was a, yes, there was a purpose right. there. When they bombed Pearl Harbor, they hit on us. Yeah. We had to go in. I think we had. We couldn't just sit idly by. It's different now. We weren't invaded now. The weapons of mass destruction, where were they? Yeah. That's why it, it's so different. But anyway, it, as I say, it's something that I'll remember the rest of my life, yeah. as long as I have left. <laughs> Do you have any other stories you want to tell me? Anything you, Anything we didn't talk about? Uh, <laughs> we were in our foxholes on Bougainville. Every night, a Japanese plane, Zero, came over, dropped the bomb, would take off. We were in our three-man foxholes every, every night. And you, as I say, you couldn't get out of your foxhole. You had to do everything in your foxhole. Our helmets were used for your lady. <laughs> this one fellow, I was close, his name was Meyer Martyr. If anything happened, it had to happen to him. The Japanese hero comes over. The red alert comes sounding. And he gets a whole face of the earth. <laughs> Get out of here! <laughs> we couldn't get him out. Did you? Um, did, well, that reminds me. Now I had one person talk about washing his uniform and, and his helmet. How did you wash your clothes? Like that. Like that. Like that. In your helmet. Right. Or if we had a, if there was a little stream, or we would take it down to wash. We have no laundry facilities on the island. And we'd, or else we'd be in just dirty clothes for God knows how long until we could find the stream or something where we could. Do you have problems with your with your feet? If you were in foxholes a lot, did you have? I still have that. Yeah. I, my toenails are terrible. They're, I, what they call it, uh, underneath there, it's not like a fungus, but that's for being in the foxholes and it. Yeah, but that's <laughs> now, you said your father was in the First World War. Yeah, he was in the First World War. And he was in the Army. He, was, he didn't serve overseas, though. He that was just in for a yeah. short time, but he never served overseas. Now, you know we have a database where you can look for draft cards. Oh, really? You might be able to find a copy of his draft card. Oh, how about that? That goes back a long, long time. It's pretty neat data. Right. So do you read books about the war? Do you, oh, yeah. Do you yeah. like to hear other people's stories? And I, I, I love to read uh, books about the war. This book that, that Tom Brokaw wrote, The Greatest Generation, I read that. And I've read quite a few other books you know, about the war. You know, you're, it's, you're interested in that. You know, when you've been through what you, you want to you know, See all you can gain, you know, information, and but like as I say, it's an experience that I lived through it. And thank God I did come out of it. Well, we're glad. Thank you very much. Because we got to hear your story. Sure, and there's nothing else you want to tell me. That's about it. Well, thank you so much okay. for, for consenting to be interviewed. Okay. It's wonderful, and I... It's and, and it's a pleasure meeting you, Kate.